Hey guys, welcome back to Day to Day Chess. This is Sabina and I'm continuing today with uh, another YouTube video. It's like a bonus video but in the same time I'm trying to catch up with the work that I missed because of what I explained to you in the previous video. I had um, a little accident and started the year in the ER. Definitely not the best way to start the year but I feel thankful uh, for being back and uh, healthy and uh, being able to do my YouTube videos once again which is something that I love doing and I hope you guys love watching as well so um, if you remember at the beginning of the year and I started announcing this from the end of last year on the 7th of January uh, we had the anniversary of the 100 year anniversary of the birth of Paul Keres, one of the strongest chess players uh, from the, you know, let's say middle 1930s till middle 1960s. And uh, not only was he a great chess player and he had the opportunity of, you know, playing um, and finishing second in the candidates uh, for four times. Unfortunately, he didn't get the chance to. Uh, um, to get the title, but um, definitely a very strong chess player. And besides from that, he has also composed some uh, very interesting studies, which uh, some of which I have shared with you in previous videos. And so because of, uh, of me being unable to post for um, a week, I decided to dedicate this video to that 100 year anniversary of his birth and for that um, anniversary I've chosen the game that he played against Mikhail Botvinnik in the Alehin Memorial or Alyohin Memorial depending how you want to pronounce um, our fourth world chess champion's uh, name um, in Moscow in 1950 so um, let's get started with the game and I hope this is um, going to remind all of you that although there are um, the world champions we, we all study the games of the world champions and those are the most predominant names that come out there um, there have been some other very strong chess players in the world that maybe haven't made it to the uh, to to the world championship haven't won the title uh, yet they have brought and left so much to chess that it is impossible for us not to remember them so um, and besides think about it how many chess players there are in the world and how many people actually make it to become world champion and if you think that way you realize that so many of us have the opportunity of leaving something behind it's just a matter of how we feel about it and what we want to leave. And then, of course, uh, hopefully, if we made the right choices, people in the future will be remembering us and um, checking our games and, you know, use them as a way of um, getting creative in their own chess later on. I think I've spoken enough. Um, so this video is dedicated once again to the... Um, strong chess player grandmaster Paul Keres. Let's check out this game. So he started with e4. This is his normal start of the game. And Mikhail Botvinnik, another, you know, former world chess champion. Uh, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3. So far, so good. Natural. d6, bishop c5, g5, um, e6. So this is called the Richter Rouser, at least to my knowledge, hopefully I didn't get this wrong. Um, I probably didn't tell this to you guys, but sometimes, I, I remember when I was a kid, I used to have trouble remembering all the names for the Sicilians, and my dad kept trying to teach me, it's not very difficult, this is this and this is that, and I would always mess it up, it didn't matter, so... Um, yeah, <laughs> it's something that I couldn't remember. It's, it's very strange, but I couldn't remember those names. And I guess I'm still having that problem now. So here's some fun fact that you didn't know about me. Um, anyways, let's keep going with the game. Here, white played queen to d2, h6. 
the idea of this move is, of course, black is trying to get uh, white to sacrifice, well, not sacrifice, but trade the bishop for the knight in f6, but unfortunately for them, they're unable to capture back with the queen, so I'm going to explain in a second why not. So they have to capture back with the g-pawn, um, so they are getting the bishop pair, but they're destroying a little bit their pawn structure, and they might have at some point some trouble with this bishop and f8. Why is that? Well, because where is the bishop going to be developed? On which diagonal is it going to be placed? Because of the way the pawns are placed right now, the bishop has to to remain in, in f8 or at least on this diagonal to protect the pawn d6. So now hopefully you're going to notice why or realize why queen takes f6 is not that great in this position because the d6 pawn remains unprotected and without having played a6 white has the opportunity of going knight b5 attacking the pawn and then if black goes back queen d8 to protect and also protect c7 because there was a threat of knight c7 check rook as well white can castle and it seems that black might have to give away that d6 pawn so that is the reason why after bishop takes f6 black has to accept to take back with the pawn you get something you give something it's always this way in chess unless of course um, the opponent makes a mistake and you get much more but in general you're give, getting something and have to give something else back um, and um, this is a very interesting line for black personally I wouldn't play it because I feel that there are too many weaknesses in black's position and it's a little bit tough to do something about the bishop and I'm being very serious when I say that I'm sorry if some of you are playing this and uh, you seem comfortable in, in this position I don't so I'm stating the truth that is probably one of the reasons you like <laughs> checking out my videos because I try to be truthful in everything I say so if you like it or not it will be here um, so long castle um, I might have or I might have not you know with a week uh, being away from my YouTube channel I got a little bit confused on whether I told you or not but Paul Kares was a very dynamic chess player and when I say dynamic it doesn't necessarily mean tactic and sacrificing and things like that. When I say dynamic, he had a very good sense of what the position, how the positions were. If you had to be sacrificing things or if you had enough time to put your pieces, he had that sense of the position very well developed. And in this position, uh, white can still take the time of castling long and then finishing up the development and black's weakness well weaknesses the double pawns this pawn in h6 this pawn in d6 they are all along weaknesses which white is going to utilize slowly so you know I think to my understanding and to how I feel is that a dynamic player is a player that is aware of the difference uh, the different positions that can arise in a game and is able to uh, react accordingly. So he realized that castling long is a safe bet. The king will go uh, to safety to b1 if necessary. And uh, if not, right now we just brought the rook to d1, um, you know, potentially bringing some pressure on d6. Black played a6. Mihail Botvinnik played a6, of course, trying to avoid knight b5. And also, this is a very typical idea in the Sicilian. Black will continue b5, b4 eventually, or will try, depending on how white reacts. That's one of the plans. Now, it's a little bit tough with so many weaknesses here. It's a little bit tough for black to choose something. So he might not choose to play b5 in this position, but try to develop their pieces and cast along. Because if you think about it, where is black going to bring this king to safety? The king side doesn't seem that safe anymore because, well, first of all, where do you move the bishop? You have to keep it to protect the pawn d6, and when you put it in e7 and castle short, my queen will immediately capture the pawn in h6, and you're going to be in trouble. So black has to consider castling long. So this b5, 
might not be the best choice for black right as of right now. Okay, and uh, Keras has played before bishop e2 in this position. Yet, for the game against Mikhail Botvinnik, he went for the attack, f4. And I like this move because, uh, well, first it closes this diagonal. So if at some point black will play some h5, try to get the bishop active, I already closed that up. Some other thing that I'm doing with this f4 is I will be preparing some f5 eventually to stabilize your double pawns here and additionally kind of try to undermine the pawn in e6 which controls the square d5 which we all know in Sicilians this square d5 is very important for white as a knight there would be giving white a big advantage so this is another idea that Paul Keres has prepared by playing f4. Now Mikhail Botvinnik is trying to be active, h5. He can't really do anything about his king for the moment. Eventually he did play bishop d7, but first he played h5, trying to create some threats with bishop a6, but unfortunately they aren't that big. So Paul Keres was safe, king b1. Maybe there were some other moves in this position that would have been good to finish the development, but he's not sure where he wants to develop this bishop, whether to put it in e2 or c4. Both of those squares would have something in mind. From e2, we keep that pawn attacked. We have the opportunity of playing bishop f3. And from c4, um, of course, there are typical sacrifices in e6 in Sicilian, so um, either one of those two would be interesting choices. So since he's not sure, he just played king b1, which is a move that white wants to do in the position anyways. Bishop d7, black is finishing the development, so is white. He decided to go for bishop e2, keep that pawn attacked, making sure black won castle short. And I think that was clear a long time ago. And um, uh, with bishop e2, white has finished their development, they made the link between the rooks, queen b6. Now in this position, later on, queen c7 was found to be an interesting choice by uh, by, by black. A queen in b6 is um, easy attacked by a knight in a4, so black is better off trying to stay a little bit more safe with queen c7. But in the game played in 1956, Mikhail Badvinik chose queen b6. Good. Now, now it's very important for you to realize, whether you're playing the Sicilian with white or black, that trades in d4 are good for whom do you think? For black. Black would like to trade pieces uh, here in d4, and the more pieces they trade, they will get to an endgame where they will have the bishop pair. So that is the reason why at this particular point, white does not want to allow that. Why couldn't black capture in d4 immediately? Well, of course they could. But then queen takes d4 would have happened. And now um, black would have some trouble developing the queen because the pawn f6 would be attacked and this queen in d4 is very strong. So whoever captures in d4, basically, uh, whoever captures in general is good for the other side, but... In this particular case, after queen b6, it's good for black. And white, of course, doesn't want to capture in c6 because it would help black to get a better bishop on the diagonal. So after queen b6, knight b3 was played, a very good move. And uh, typical, I want you to, to remember that. And Mikhail Botvinnik finally brings his king to safety. Okay, so can we really attack that king right now? Not exactly. How do you want to do that? I mean, both kings are castled on the same side, and although that king might be weaker than this one, there don't seem to be any ways to bring the pieces to attack it, and white has no file to this king in c8. Therefore, we have to think positionally. What were black's problems as he captured back with the pawn? Well, these double pawns, so we need to do something about it. So Paul Keras played rook h to f1, preparing this f5 move, a very strong move. Botvinnik is trying to trade the knight once again to go towards an endgame. And here I really, I, I really love this move that Paul Keras made. At the beginning it wasn't clear for me what was the exact idea. This rook f3, it has a bunch of ideas. 
One of them is to think of utilizing the third rank as a means of attack, like for example rook h3 or rook d3 to try to put some pressure there, or if this knight moves, rook c3 check would be a possibility. But uh, in the same time, maybe I want to double on the f-file, although mm, probably not, but it's good to have the rook, you know, flexible. That's what Dr. Tarash always was saying. Be sure that your rook has the possibility of moving around. So this rook f3, I thought, was really a great choice by uh, Paul Karras. And black doesn't seem to have many ideas here. I mean, they have to do something about this knight. They placed it in a5. They might as well just trade it, right? So that's exactly what happened. And here, it's very important for you to realize with which pawn do you capture back. In general, we're always capturing towards the center. But in this position, wouldn't it be better to capture with the c-pawn to open up the c-file to the king? And the answer is no. It, this move would not be better. Think about what black wants to do. He wants to enter in an endgame. Um, and so if we're thinking that the pieces will get traded and uh, we will enter in an endgame, black would be much better off because they have a mobile majority, right? Here, they can create a pass pawn, whereas white just destroyed their majority by capturing back. Plus, on the c-file, they don't do anything. They would probably just give a check, and I would go king b8, or maybe I can just go king b8 right away, and white can't do anything on the c-file. So be sure when you're capturing, you're considering the future and what you're actually doing with your capture. So a takes b3, no need to worry about this file having been opened. Um, knight a4 is a possibility that we can do very soon. King b8, knight a4. Paul Karras didn't wait very much, he just went for it. Um, now the queen is, um, is attacked, so black has two choices. Either move the queen, which is exactly what Mihail Botvinnik did, or capture the knight. But if you would capture the knight, not only is black giving away their bishop pair, but they're giving away their good bishop, because this one is kind of stuck in f8, still having to protect the weaknesses. Um, additionally, white has undoubled their pawn, so it's definitely in white's favor. So that's why Mihail Botvinnik probably chose queen a7. But unfortunately for him, this position, position thinking of it positionally, is um, much, much better for white, especially after the following move, f5. A very good positional move, stabilizing the weaknesses, um, and like I said earlier, trying to undermine the control over the d5 square. Poor black, what to do if they were to play e5, this knight can come back towards d5, or we can think of some idea with queen a5, knight b6 to totally leave this queen in a7 stuck there. Um, and with the pawns closed like this, this bishop is totally dead. So that's something black doesn't want to do. So Mihail Botvinnik decided to play bishop e7, defend the weakness and hope that the position will not go in white's favor, but unfortunately for him, after capture, capture, there's a really good move that white has in this position, and I really hope you can pause the video and find it. That move is rook takes f6. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, this bishop in e7 doesn't really protect that pawn, because now after bishop takes, the simply check and knight b6, whether you can go in c a2, Still knight b6 check, you have to sacrifice the queen, and white is winning here. So, unfortunately, uh, for black, he had to give away this pawn. Mihail Botvinnik, though, he didn't give up that easily. He played rook h7 in this position. What is the idea of this move? Well, you know, trying to protect a little bit the 7th rank. Um... In this position, b5 had to be calculated, and um, hopefully when you looked at rook takes f6, you have seen this b5 move, intermediate move, for black, and um, so what you're doing here, and the move that you're doing is rook f7. You have to do something because both your knight and rook are being attacked, so you can't 
just move the knight because now after queen takes if you just go back let's just put this on the board after queen takes d6 this queen has opened there's even if it wouldn't be open there's no more knight that can go to b6 to force me to do something uh, bad in this position uh, black would be winning so obviously white has to find a good move after b5 and that move is rook f7 and after bishop e8 we still have a good move which is rook g7 and black might think that they they are winning after capturing in a4 but unfortunately for them they are not because there are too many weaknesses in black's position and too many pins going on plus a very bad king and after e5 black gets ready to resign very soon besides all of those pins that i showed you there's also bishop f3 or queen um, e4 bishop f3 is much stronger obviously because d5 would not be possible because of the loss of the bishop in e7 and white is winning here so um, this um, after bishop c6 let's say we can simply take and um, this position is just much better for white so um, unfortunately Black played rook h7. What to do next? Well, we have to move the rook. So, Paul Karras remained active, rook g6. He has a pawn up, but black has the bishop pair. So, we have to think, okay, um, there's... It is possible that black might have some ideas here, you know. So, just let's try to make sure we stay active and that black's bishops are going to stay passive. Um, even if... if um, um, this position, the other position actually, after he takes d6, uh, looks quite bad for black. I think this was the choice that black had to take um, instead of rook h7. After rook g6, really, I don't see how black can get active. And from here on, the game didn't last much longer. Um, b5, of course, the knight goes back. And after queen c5, it is very important for white to find a good way to improve the position of one of their pieces and that piece is this knight in c3 this knight in c3 doesn't do anything so we need to find a better place to bring it to and that place is d3 so how do you bring the knight there well in three moves by starting with knight a2 and now knight b4 black is trying to get active on the f file but there's really not very much that they can do after bishop f3 the file is closed and when Mikhail Botvinnik tried h4 with the idea h3 white played h3 stopping him from doing so and again black is stuck he has to keep their bishops to protect these two weaknesses their rooks can do very much and white is simply continuing their plan to bring the knight in d3 then this knight could go to f4 put some pressure there and white will be winning very soon and that's exactly what happened in the game after queen c7 knight f4 taking that pawn rook f6 and here bishop g4 and after trading the rooks in this position bishop b7 white just captured in e6 now bishop d5 trading the last you know defend not the last but one of the last defending pieces of blacks and after queen takes d5 rook f7 e5 black decided to resign that bishop is stuck there this pawn is going to promotion he's also threatening to take in d6 and game over i really enjoyed this game and i chose it as one of my favorites of paul Karras. he has many more as beautiful as this one and uh, i hope i gave you a good taste of uh, one of the strongest chess players in the world and since it was his uh, 100 year anniversary i had to do this a little bit later but it's better later than never and once again i had a really bad uh, thing happening to me thank god everything is fine i really wish you all the best for this new year be safe out there and um, may this be your best year yet take care and i'll see you in the next video bye